David, he was doing that. And it kind of stuck with me. I like it. Uh, I, caught it. I caught that on the stack as well. I, I just got, I think he told me he picked that up from the stack. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? We're going to get started on page four, Are You Washed in the Blood? I just now realized. So let's go back one to page three. Angel Band. Thank you. 
little steel guitar. sure uh, we're going to have our announcements done by Kurt today. So yeah, yeah. I kind of had to look at him and make eye contact because I wasn't sure myself. I knew he did it earlier, so I was kind of just whatever Mike wanted to grab, it don't matter. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Well, I'm a funny-looking Larry. Uh, he is uh, at a grandson's wedding this weekend, so we pray for him for that. A uh, couple quick announcements. Thursday night, fifth Thursday night sings over at the stockyards this coming Thursday, July 29th. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs, uh, bring a dessert if you'd like. And then uh, the Ozark Mountain Four, which is Gil Turk's band. That's Charles Turk's grandson. His bluegrass band is going to be bringing the music. Um, another quick one, August 1st, which is next Sunday, Jonathan Gold. Uh, if you know Denny and Sandy Gold, that's their son. He's going to be being our guest speaker next Sunday for all three services. So he'll be bringing our message to us next Sunday. Uh, and then I was asked, um, we, we lost a lady this past week, Shirley Hart, if anybody knows her. Um, her services are going to be at Walnut Lawn Tuesday, 3 p.m. is the visitation, 4 p.m. is the service. So remember that family, and if you can go, you're, you're welcome to go to that. Um, do you want me to do birthdays and stuff yeah. while I'm here? Yeah. Sure. Any other announcements we need? Anybody here for the first time? Any visitors? Sam, or no, wasn't Sam, is, is his lady there. there and one over here. Awesome, welcome. You Glad you're here. Oh, another one over here somewhere. Awesome, welcome from Florida. All right. Southerners. Southerners. Any birthdays today? Got birthday, birthday Tuesday, or this past week, this coming week. We're, we're flexible. There's some more. All right. How about anniversaries? We'd like Jeff to sing both. No anniversaries? Well, Jeff, Jeff we got this birthday. I'm going to let Dawson do it. Oh, Dawson's going to do it. All right. Yeah, yeah. Jump in there. It's kind of hard to play banjo if you forget your banjo at home, so that's why I'm not up here today. Um. <laughs> All right. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Hey, 
Hey, you got to appreciate Dawson for his honesty, you know what? I wasn't going to tell on him, but... <laughs> that young man's a lot of fun to play music with. Yeah, but Jeff, you weren't going to tell about the time that I needed you to count from be quiet, three, be quiet. From he's, three, he's going to tell a story from three down to two, and you said if you weren't looking at page numbers, you wouldn't know how to subtract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. Hold on to this. That's no problem. I do it all the time. Yeah, you don't have to be a teenager to forget something. That's right. Uh, Y'all got one of these, or if you didn't, there's some blanks back here on the back table by the cardboard box. And we're asking for your opinion on Jeff Bryant. Some people know him as Catfish. If you would like to have him as your associate pastor, that'd be like assistant pastor uh, moving forward. So just vote or put on there yes, no, comments. We welcome any comments, but just give us your opinion. We'll tally him up, see where we land. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. We're going to turn to page 40. Kurt, I'm glad I'm not the only one that does that. I'm, I'm guilty of that stuff all the time. Count all the way to 40? Well, luckily, <laughs> he's still giving me a hard time about not being able to count. And he's really not lying. <laughs> but, no, I know. But we'll turn to page 40, and hopefully you all can find it. Don't ask me how to get there. And um, we'll Shelly, try to keep on the me. sunny side. Shelly told me. <laughs> I can't listen to everything she says. <laughs> There's a dark and a troubled side of life There's a bright and sunny side too Though you meet in the darkness and strife The sunny side may also find you Keep on the sunny side Always on the sunny side Keep on the sunny side Some songs in a hurry today. Hey Dawson, you may have forgot your banjo, but you didn't forget your vocal, did you? No. You want to do I'll Fly Away? Why not? <laughs> there we go. Everybody's liking that idea. We we'll soon find out. 
<laughs> I don't even know English. I don't either. What page is that on? It's on 28. 28. song here right quick. Nothing like being prepared, that's right. We're going to block the page numbers out of his book. <laughs> Let's turn to page 15. This is one that's up anyway. I think we've done this a few weeks ago, but uh, farther along. Do we do that in A? I think so. Yeah. 
when death has come and taken our other ones, it leaves our home so lonely and dreary. And then do we wonder why others prosper? turn. You ready to sing it? And when we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes down home in the sky, keep going guys, you're doing good, then we shall be him in that bright land. We'll understand it all by and by. And far job singing out there each and every one of you guys we got some special music uh we're gonna get shirley which is actually part of our group if you want to think of it yeah. it's our steel player's wife so you better you better play this song right <laughs> but shirley's got our special for us today Check, check. What's the name again, Shirley? Mary the River. You ready? Singing and 
Thank you, Shirley. Scotty, you're up. This is the reason all we always do the specials at the end. That way I don't ever have to yeah, sing yeah. past these we people. Sure, we can't add to it, can we, Jeff? <laughs> can't add any more to that. Oh. So I, just, I, know, I know when it's time for Jeff to get out of the way. There you go. I may not know a lot, but I know that. <laughs> Well, guys, that was just wonderful. What a delight to uh, to hear your musicianship displayed so profoundly. Beautiful job. I'll be preaching this morning, uh, the Lord willing, out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you have your Bible, your iPhone, or your iPad, or your computer, or your wife's Bible or something, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We've not been here in a long time in 2 Corinthians, so... It's okay to look in your index for the number. I could give you the number, but it would not be in your Bible, so I'll stay out of that. Second Corinthians, the, ch the fourth chapter. Um, the title of my message this morning will be, Don't Lose Heart. It's, in other words, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Because, guys, listen, we've all suffered a lot lately. This has been an extreme time, and many of you have lost freedoms over this last year that you... Um, uh, I don't know if we'll ever get some of them back. Freedoms to, to go, to do, to be uh, with family, get-togethers. And uh, right now, I've got a granddaughter who, who came home. Uh, I got my mask somewhere. Oh, my mask in the truck. Okay, my granddaughter came home from High Street's children's camp last week. She came home two days ago, and a lot of them had got COVID, and she wasn't feeling good this morning, so I don't know. So I may be exposed, so don't be kissing on me, okay? I don't want to give anybody anything bad. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff going on. Discouragement. Oh, I, I'm running into so much discouragement from Christian people. Uh, they're despairing uh, of the, the news we're hearing and the direction. It's just a heartbreaking time. <clears throat> We've lost a dear church person yesterday, or we'll be burying her Tuesday, uh, Shirley Hart. Dear, precious lady, uh, one of God's truly best saints, and uh, she's gone home. Uh, you know, you've heard the story. There's just a lot of people have gone. We, uh, over the past few years, we've talked about 
what's happened to our Thursday night crowd? We said, well, you know, used to be there's 300 people attend on Thursday nights. What's happened? They all died. I'm telling you, hundreds of them have gone on home to be with the Lord. People who attended on Thursday night are no longer here. They graduated. They've gone on home. And so we've just experienced a whole lot of loss over the years. Uh, in September, uh, on our baptism day, I'm planning to read uh, the number of the people who have died in my tenure here as pastor. And the, the, not the names of the people baptized, but uh, give you some reports on that. But anyway, it's, a, it's been a time of difficulty recently. <clears throat> I have recently uh, been experiencing in my own personal life this problem, and that is the questions are coming faster than the answers. Has anybody else felt like that? Questions are there. I've got a young, my youngest brother uh, is suffering from ALS and, and is, is not doing well. And, and my heart is just broken because, Lord, why him? You know, why, why the best among us? Why not take the old, ugly, mean ones like me and leave him here? You know, I don't know. A lot of questions, that I'm not finding answers. I know the answers, okay? I'm just saying I can say the right things, but sometimes your heart feels things that you that you sh- that knows it better than your mouth says it. So what are we going to do when life crashes in on us? What are you going to do when you get the bad news or the disappointment or the what are you going to do? How are you going to handle when life are we supposed to just soldier on and and stiff up or lift it and just push through? That's what I hear people say all the time. I just you have to just tough through it, tough through it, man, you know, just uh Suck it up and move on. Or is there a way forward that's joyful, that's optimistic, that's victorious, hopeful? I'm here today to tell you there is a way forward that's good and joyful and optimistic and hopeful. And you don't just have to soldier through. You don't just have to suck it up and hang in. You can literally celebrate in this difficult time. I'm going to talk about that today. Paul's going to tell us how to do that. The text I want to use today, I want to start with verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 4, 1, where he says these words, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose hope. That's what he says. We do not lose hope. We don't give up. We don't get in despair. We have a ministry. We have a project. We have a mission to do, and we do not give up. And, and it's not just that we bear through it and suck it up or hard nose through it, he says there is a ministry, there is a reason, there, and through God's mercy. Since God has so generously let us in on what He's doing, He's let us know, He's told us what He's doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into hard times. We're not going to quit. You're not going to quit either. We're going to make it through. Today, we're going to talk about how to stay in the fight, how to remain optimistic, and hopeful in the midst of it all. That's what I hope to do today. We're going to be preaching today out of the book of Cor- Corinthians. It was written. This book was written to a church at Corinthians. And the people there, of course, were called Corinthians. But <clears throat> the name is an interesting name. And I'll explain to you in a moment what, it, why, or what, what the, the connotations that have been adept, that have been connected to the name. Corinth is a very large city in its time. At the time, it was 600,000 people when Paul was writing to the church there at Corinth. It was a very modern city for its day. It had all the modern problems of a big city. It had uh, uh, cultural diversity. It had mixing of uh, uh, racial dis- d- diversity, of blending of religions. There was a lot of blending of religions. Uh, the sexual immorality in the city was just rampant. And depravity was in the city. In fact, the word Corinthianize, to Corinthianize someone, was, would meant, well, to, meant, which meant to practice fornication. To Corinthianize, it actually meant that. Now, I could say if I said it in Greek, it would be clearer if you understood Greek. But anyway, it, you know, I thought, how do I explain this? And then I remembered, we use the word today when we talk about Californication. All right, you heard that first? All right, so it's the same thing. 
instead of Californication, it's Corinthianized. It means the same thing. All right, so we, we connect uh, that to the name of the town. Okay, so that was going on there. <clears throat> Paul taught that the gospel of Jesus Christ <clears throat> was their answer. And I'm going to say today, right up front, that is the answer to our problem. That's how we get through this with joy, with hope, is we hold on to Jesus Christ. He is the answer. Now, it may sound overly simplistic for me to say that to you today. You say, I expected a preacher to say that. You know, you expect, let me tell you, it's the truth, whether I say it or whether I don't say it. It's the truth. Jesus is the answer. answer. Now, today, in Paul's letter, in his writing to, Cor- to the church in Corinth, he's going to talk about the weaknesses inherent or endemic in their family, in their churches, in their culture, in their society, and even in their church. Their church in Corinth was, uh, it was expressing some, so much of what the culture was, was about. Uh, in fact, one of, the lead, one of the elders in the church at Corinth was having a sexual relationship with his mother-in-law. Uh, and it, just, it went on and on and on. Uh, it was a difficult, difficult time. And so Paul was writing to these people, and he didn't talk. He didn't beat them up. He, you know, he wasn't so judgmental. He told what truth was, that truth was truth, but he talked about their brokenness. He said, you guys are broken. And, and by the way, I'm going to listen because I happen to be broken myself. Um, <laughs> let me give away my sermon today. Um, God works best through crack pots anyway. Think about it, right? Any crack pots here? Uh-huh. Yeah, he works best through us old crack pots. We're gonna re- we'll get there in a moment. So we're going we're gonna to look at this today and see if we can figure out how we can stay strong in our weakness because we are weak. We are broken, and God can use people that are broken <clears throat> because if he only had to use people that were perfect, wow, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? The world would be in trouble because I've not met many of them. In fact, I think the last one died about 2,000 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> now, what can we do to make our faith work? That probably doesn't bug you, but it is me. Sorry about that. What can we do to make our faith work in these difficult times? What are you going to do? How are you going to hold on with your cracked pot, as it were? How are you going to make life work? Well, Paul starts in verse 2 by telling us not to hide our gospel, not to, hide, to veil, to pull the veil off our gospel. Let's read it. Rather, we have renounced sacred and shameful things. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, this is quite a complicated couple of sentences here. But generally, Paul is saying, live so that you don't hide, have to hide stuff in your life. Live in a way, live out in the open. Don't have to always be sneaking around and hiding things. He said, that's not the way Christians live. We're veiling we're covering over our gospel. He said, don't do it. Rather, we keep everything we do and everything we say out in the open. Well, we, the whole truth is on display. We display all the truth in our life. And everybody can then see and judge for themselves the pres- whether about the presence of God. So how are you veiling the gospel in your life? I don't know in your life completely, but I know this. If we allow secret and shameful things to run our lives, to control our lives, if we allow it, then we're veiling our gospel. We're hiding it. And then by being deceitful. Is there any deceit? Yeah, there's deceit in us. We're human beings. I have grandchildren. And those precious, loving children would rather lie to me than tell me the truth. Is that my iPad you got? No, Papo, I didn't get it. You know, or it's in his hand. No, I, not me. I didn't get it. I'm saying, you know, we're by nature, we are deceitful people. 
<clears throat> Paul says, what do you do? How is that going to work? The, the, by, don't let that run our life. In other words, we, we're trying to give it to God and be out in the open, not be deceitful. And then the next thing he says <clears throat> is don't distort the Word of God. Okay, well, pr- well, preacher, I don't distort the Word of God. Yeah, you do. Every time you take God's Word and make it and you bend it to fit what you want it to say. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I don't have examples because I'll be, just be giving examples out of my own life. I don't want you looking at my life. I want... Is this is my turn to it's your turn to look at yourself. <clears throat> don't distort, don't twist God's word to suit yourself. Don't twist God's word to make what you want to happen uh, uh, acceptable or, or open or ready. Don't do that. That's we twist the word of God. We're to renounce these ways of living because they dim the light of the gospel. Now that's I've talked about that. So how now do you get rid of that veil? How do you pull it off? How do you live out in the open and, and, and in the light? Well, Paul says, <clears throat> we set forth the truth. We set the truth forth plainly. See, we keep everything we, we say and everything we're doing out in the open. You know, what's such a joy to live out in the open? I, I can't remember through the years as being a pastors of churches. I've had secretaries that worked with me and for me. And, and I remember sometimes when a, a new secretary came, well, pastor, uh, sh- should we open your mail? You know, sh- could, should we listen on? I said, I do nothing in, in secret. In, anything I got, you look into it. If I got mail, you can read it. You know, because I don't want to live in a secret life. I want to live in the open. Now, I'm not perfect, okay? But I do not want to hide my life. So we keep everything we're doing and out in the open. We keep the truth that we know in, in, on display. Let, let's read verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the mind minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God now let me start over here in verse 4 the god of this age i don't know how your translation has it there but my the god there is with a small g is yours and then later the image of G with a capital G. Well, that's how our translators are communicating to us. There are two kinds of gods at work here, two different gods. Now, the God of this world, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Listen so carefully to me now, because if you don't listen to this, you're going to be discouraged. I promise you. You're going to be discouraged when you try to tell your neighbors, your children, your grandchildren, the people you work with, when you try to tell them about the Lord. You're going to be discouraged if you don't understand this. Their eyes have been blinded. Remember I told you last Sunday, one of the, one of the four things I've been telling you for five years is that we're coming, a, a coming great deception is about to happen on the earth. And that great deception didn't just start five years ago. It's been coming a long time. But right now it's reaching a new level of intensity where people's eyes are blinded to the truth. When I was a child, when I came to the Lord as a young man, <clears throat> I was around a lot of people my age and older, you know, whatever, country people. Every one of them was one step from salvation. One, every one of them. Every one of them trusted the church. They trusted pastors. They believed that they needed to be saved, whether they were or not. They believed the, all the things that I believed. And all we had to do was move them that one step to accept Christ. They were that, they were that close to the cross. Folks, that is absolutely not true today. The people you're going to be working with, they're miles from the cross. And, and so that journey from where they are to where, we, where they need to be is a long journey. And you're going to get discouraged if you don't realize that there's a spiritual war going on in their life. The God of this world, of, this air, of the air, has blinded them. Let's read it again. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so some of you I know have been discouraged. I've had people tell me recently, I'm so discouraged. I'm not able able to win my friends to the Lord. I don't know what to tell them. I don't know how to get them to Christ. I want to say to them, look, you can't believe for them, but you can just be a witness in their life. You can tell them about Jesus, tell them what the Word of God says, but you cannot make people believe. Your job is presentation by truth and life 
Your job is to go to the whole world and preach the gospel. Baptize in the name of the Father, you know, the whole thing you know, of the Great Commission. So, please be aware, we're working behind enemy lines, telling people about the gospel, but we're telling it to people who have been blinded. And that's our culture today. That's why we've got such a diverse culture in America, in the world. <clears throat> why some are so far. You know, even also, let's go back when I was young, about 100 years ago. Let's go back when I was a kid. Everybody was pretty close together. The right and the left, the Democrats, Republicans, you know, and all that big a difference. But today, I mean, there is a huge gulf between us. Okay, uh, we have cha- we've had such a change in our culture. So we've got to keep the focus on Jesus Christ. It can't be about the cowboy church or the Presbyterian church or the Baptist church or the Methodist church. Folks, when we get to that, we've lost in fact, that's the kind of the, the, the fight we've been having for a long time, not here, but in the world, in evangelical Christianity, and that has just destroyed people. People don't care about denomination any longer. That don't matter. That doesn't work. We have to keep our eyes upon Jesus. <clears throat> I've had people say, man, we've, we've got to get people into cowboy church. The cowboy church won't save anybody. We've never saved anybody. Now, we've been a mouthpiece God has used. And God has preached through you and through me and, me and others, through the message and song and uh, all the leaders. You know what I'm talking about. We've been preaching that gospel, and we've seen hundreds of people come to Christ because we preached the word. But we didn't bring anybody to God through being a part of the cowboy church. It's through Jesus. And that's the only way to heaven. Verse 5, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Did you get that? Paul said, we're not talking about us. In fact, we're coming to you as your servant. Not a servant of Jesus. Read it carefully. You're, we're coming as your servant. We serve this world. We come to people in this world to serve them so that they'll know about Jesus. Let's keep going. Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts and to give us the light of knowledge of, the, of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The message cannot be about you. And so often we say, we, we think we're like this. Well, I, I've got it pretty well. I've got it pretty much together. I'm about as good as I'm going to get, you know. I'm, I'm pretty hot stuff in this Christian stuff. Christian world, and I'm going to come to you lowly sinners and you no good people out of church, and I'm going to reach down from my ivory tower, and I'm going to lift you up to where I am. Do you get it? You get the ego and all that? That's not Christianity, folks. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's how we come. We come humbly sharing our faith. It's not about us. We we try to make it all about me and you, but it's not about us. It's about Jesus. We're the messengers. We never, this church has never got anybody into heaven. This, this church has never got anybody into heaven. Jesus gets people into heaven. That's the only way. So the Bible teaches us, Paul says, that we give God our light and that's how people find Jesus, because out of their darkness, the light of Christ that's in us shines to them. Now, I want to tell you as we move to verse 7, that you are vulnerable, as I am. We're all vulnerable. We are, as Paul is going to use the reference here, to a jar of clay. A jar of clay. He's not talking about a, a kiln, a kiln fired piece of ceramics. He's talking about a primitive, crude piece of mud pie that's kind of turned into a, a jar. You with me? It's breakable. You, you bump it against the edge of something and it shatters. It's fragile. And he says, that is who you are. We're fragile jars of clay. Now, let's read it. But we have this treasure. What treasure is that? It's Jesus. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus who is in us. We are the jar. The real treasure is inside. And when, and when our jars 
crack. <laughs> Come on, you crackpots. Come on. When our jars crack, you with me? What shines out? The light of Jesus that's inside shines through the cracks. You think I'm kidding? You should go with me to hospitals. and You should come with me to, to nursing homes. You should come where people are really broken and really cracked. And those that know the Lord, that light shines out. It just shines out to the nurses, to the doctors, to the staff. It shines out. It glows when the pot cracks. The, Jesus comes through the cracks. And that's what we're to do. And that's how we get this, this, this work, make this work. That's how we, we win. We're joyful. We're optimistic because it's not us. It's Christ in us. That's our hope of glory. Okay. No trouble can stop us when Jesus is inside. Nothing can help you when he's not. But when he's inside, nothing can stop you. Listen carefully. Nothing can stop you. COVID can't stop us. Yeah. Shortages can't stop us. Uh, negative public opinions can't stop us. Woke people can't stop us. Political correctness can't stop us. Past failures can't stop us. Nothing can stop us when Jesus is on the inside of, of your pot, in your clay pot. When he's in there, I don't care how fragile you are, nothing can stop you. Let's read verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, yeah, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. That's the pot that you are. That's your clay pot. And when that happens, you need to know Jesus is, is there on the inside. And when he's on the inside, here we go, we win every time. <clears throat> the, the key here <clears throat> is to truly stop lying to yourself. And recognize the fact that you are dead in Christ. See, you can't kill a dead person. Have you ever thought about that? They already done it. You can't kill a dead person. And if we're dead in Christ, then in Christ, you know, you get the whole thing here. It's a metaphor, I know. But, but follow through with it. If you have given up your life and you've given your life to Christ... And you, were, you put your sin on the cross with him, and you've followed him to the cross. And, and, you know, the whole death to self thing has happened in your life. It's not I live, but Christ who lives in me. You know, when you've come to that point, you are dead in Christ, and you are then in a place to be optimistic, to be joyful, to be a winner all the way through the difficulty. Let's read verse 10. Verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Now, that's a little double talk, a little double speak, but it's very accurate. We, we, we live in, we live our, understand our death in Christ because we know that reveals our life in Christ. Let's keep going, verse 11. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then... Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. I am crucified with Christ, and so are you. If you know the Lord, you don't live any longer for yourself. You don't live for any other thing than for the glory of the Lord. Why, why are you here? What's your purpose? What's your motive for living? Do you know the Lord Jesus? Are you following him? If you found him and he's found you, then you live in him, for him, and through him. And he has filled you up. I am crucified, yet I live. I've got some good news for you. Are you ready for some good news? Don't, you, don't we need some good news? The best is yet to come. That's the best news I can give you. The best is yet to come. We've seen the, some good stuff, but we've seen some bad stuff. But the best is just around the corner. Let's read verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I've spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit. So that the, the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. On that dark Sunday morning. In that grave in Jerusalem, on that cold slab, covered up with that, that shroud of death, was the Lord Jesus Christ, dead from crucifixion. 
blood loss, torture, torment, but that body was at peace. It was dead. He was laying on that slab, and from heaven, the Father reached dimensionally down, 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 down. And he took Jesus by the hand, and he said, rise up, my son. And Jesus came back to life from that tomb on that old cold slab. And he's alive still yet to this day. And Paul just reminded us, and we know this too, that the very same thing is coming for me and you. The very same. One day we are going to be dead or dying or whatever, and we're going to reach up and take the hand of Jesus and walk through the valley of the shadow of death with Him holding our right hand as we walk through that valley on into heaven. <clears throat> he says, That's, this is how this is going to work. That death has raised us with Jesus and will present us to Himself. All this is for your benefit, that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Listen, I know it's discouraging right now. I get it. But the best is yet to come. Hold on. Don't give up. Don't despair. There's a better day coming. Okay, so here's my sermon. Here's the final thought. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. We don't despair. Though outwardly we're wasting away. Oh, goodness. Has anybody noticed that lately? Huh? Outwardly we're wasting away. My goodness. A, f- a fellow this morning had been attending Cowboy Church, and the oddest thing was he heard me singing at one of the services, and it triggered a thought in his mind. He said, I've heard that voice before, and he got to checking because he recognized my voice from when I was in high school. And uh, he said, are you that Scotty Gillingsworth that was, he said, I called, you probably don't know Ike, but Ike was my best friend in high school, one of my best friends. And uh he died in Vietnam, but he was. This guy was also a friend of his, and we were, we got to talking. Have I confused you? We had the same friend. Okay, so he came to me, and here we were in our <clears throat> early seventies, and uh, we don't look like we did then. We have wa- we we have wasted away. <laughs> Though outwardly, outwardly we're wasting away, nobody has a problem with that. Yet inwardly, here we go, we are being renewed day by day. The inside of me does not reflect the outside of me. Because the outside of me is going one way, but the inside of me is going another way. Hallelujah. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, here it is now, not on what is seen, this stuff, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Guys and ladies and boys and girls, keep your eyes on Jesus. I know this world scares us, makes us worried. Don't focus on this. This is temporary. Focus on what is eternal. And that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Don't get caught in that trap. Don't give up the hope that you have. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. When the old devil comes, and boy, he came to me this week so plainly. uh, I don't have time to get into it, but he came and tried to scare me. I just turn around and say, Jesus, sick him. Get after him. It's not my fight. I can't handle him, but I know who can. And I rebuked him in the name of Jesus because I knew what spirit was driving that man or that lady, quite honestly, is what it was. Keep my eyes on Jesus. Don't look. Don't get a, be afraid of the devil. Don't be scared. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. If you don't know Christ, this is the day you need to give him your life. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, our love for you can't be spoken as your word for us. Love for us can't be spoken either. It's too profound and too deep. But I want to assure you, Lord, that you are our life and that we'd consider ourselves dead in you, but therefore we live in you. So, Father, today, with that thoughts done and said, 
would you help us? Would you come and not let us look at this old, crazy, messed up world that scares us, that haunts us, that threatens us, but to keep our eyes upon you who has promised us resurrection and life eternal. Father, bless us today as we go about another week in a crazy, messed up world. But we're not going to go out here beat up. We're going to go out of here as people that can't be kept down because of you. We love you, Lord. In Christ I pray. Amen. We'll turn to page 55, Sweet Hour of Prayer. There's an old hymn which some of us will remember. It goes way back. It says, O Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. And that's something that we need to understand today. We, we do such foolish things. We turn away from you when you know that you give us manna every day. You give us spiritual food. You give us physical food. You've given us a kingdom to be a part of and to look forward to. And we just pray that you help us to realize what we have. And for those who are not already your possession, the things that they can have, that you're willing and able to give. We just pray that you'll be with us in all the ways that we need it be with our overworked medical staff, making decisions about COVID patients, making decisions in some cases whether people get to live or people have to die. And we just pray for those who are in the military making difficult decisions, some of them facing life and death situations. Just be with us in all the ways that we need it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
think it is. Man, it's just almost unbearable out there. That gets me. It really does, Jeff. I know, I know. I read something in a Reader's Digest about that, uh, or maybe it 